and welcome to the latest episode of Word on the Snakevine. I'm Ross Deakin and we're here to talk to you today about venomous research, snake bite initiatives and a venomous animal constellation going on all the way around the world. Today I have joining me... Hi I'm Ed. And also today we have our first ever guest on the show. We have Ray Morgan from the Venom Interviews. Um, hi Ray, how are you doing? I'm very well thanks, how are you? Uh, I'm, I'm okay, so I'm a little bit tired, it's been a long day today with work, but uh, it's all the better to uh, to be recording a podcast, it's just the more fun times of the week really. Um, so today we have, we have Ray on the show to talk about uh, some of the work that he's been involved in with the Venom interviews and his current work in snakebite initiatives in sub-Saharan Africa and also with him living in, in Costa Rica to actually talk about a little bit about Costa Rican herps and how uh, and, and herping within, within that area and the impact and some of the impacts of the increase in popularity within that area is, is having on, on the herp life. So, so Ray, to start off, I think it would be quite good if you could if you could tell us how you kind of got into herpetology and, and kind of why did you get into herpetology and kind of the fields that you actually work within. Uh, well, okay. Um, well, I think that, uh, like most of us, the bug bit at some point, I think I was probably around six years old or so and was, uh, you know, watching Wild Kingdom and, and things like that on TV. And, and what caught my attention more than anything else was... Uh, was anything to do with reptiles and, and snakes in particular. And then so by the time I was you know, early in elementary school, I was the weird kid in, uh, in class drawing disturbingly accurate pictures of snakes eating people. And <laughs> they uh, probably assumed that I need, needed some kind of help. But that kind of fixation never really went away. So, uh, you know, by you know seven or so, I, was, I started keeping snakes. And I think by the time I was ten... I had taken over the complete garage, and uh, the, the walls were lined with snake cages, and the center was where we raised rodents to feed them, and uh, it's kind of taken over, you know, taken over my life. Well, what was your actual first snake? My first, first snake thing? was a garter snake. Um, of like, like most people in the U.S., uh, it seems to be that their first snake is a garter snake, and that was, in fact, one of my very favorite parts uh, of the Venom interviews was shooting all these interviews, and I asked uh, everybody the same question you just asked me. Well, how does it start? How did you get started? What was your first animal? And what came up time after time after time was garter snake, garter snake, garter snake, garter snake. And to the point that it became it became funny, and I ended up having to kind of <laughs> hold my nose to to not you know ruin a take by laughing as people describe their first garter snake. So uh, I, I guess I'm very typical in that regard among herpers. It, Garter snakes is where I started. Did, did you, I mean, I can did, uh, just point in there. Paul also started out on a garter snake, funny enough, but then he made the leap to a wild caught retic. So, <laughs> oh, well, that, that's a big jump. <laughs> yeah, just a bit of a leap, but garter snake again, starting out with um, one of the big names in herpetology. Did yeah, you? Well, you know, uh, did you actually? Did ahead. you catch your own garter snake though? No, that one. Uh, you know what? It was really strange and now looking back i can't remember why this worked out the way it did but i lived in an area uh, a rural but developing area of southern california an area called the inland empire which was about 50 miles east of los angeles and we had lots of king snakes and gopher snakes and um you know we would coach whip snakes and we had you know uh red diamond rattlesnakes we had southern pacific rattlesnakes um so we had a lot of a lot of wildlife there but for whatever reason, the first snake I got was a plains garter snake, a Thamnophis radix was my first one, which comes from the Midwest. Um, and it was one that I just, uh, there was a particular pet store not far from me that I used to stalk all the time. And, you know, this goes back to the 70s when there were indigo snakes for $100 and um, things like that. But this one garter snake, I decided, well, that was that was the one. That was going to be the first, the first snake. And so that was the one I brought home and uh, it, it pretty it pretty rapidly snowballed from there. Then uh, the king snakes and gopher snakes and other garter snakes came in. Uh, I still love garter snakes. They have a special place in my heart. Um, and then when I was, I guess I was about, um, I must have been about 10 when I discovered a an importer in Los Angeles called Western Zoological. Uh, it was a, a company that imported from all over the world and supplied zoos and other collectors and 
that was the first time where I walked into kind of like a big warehouse and you could see, you know, ball pythons right off the, uh, you know, fresh from Africa, or you could see, um, you know, monocle cobras and spectacle cobras from Asia and, and retics and, and other things. And to see all of these things that I knew you couldn't get in the U S and they were just there and you could buy them and you could take them home. And, um, that just blew my mind. I think that that's, I think for, for all of us, it's, it's kind of a similar start. Uh, we all, we've all had obviously quite a similar start. I think I was a little bit older, but I, I actually uh, didn't like snakes at all up until probably about so it was about eight, seven, eight years ago. I, uh, I actually was probably had a phobia, and I thought oh, I've got to get over this. I just I, I kept lizards at just at the time, and I was like, I'll just go out and buy snakes. So I went out and bought a snake. It wasn't a garter snake, though. Now I feel like I wish it was. <laughs> I mean, I sat on a corner, and now I'm feeling like I should have sat on a garter snake. As well. <laughs> I, I don't yeah. imagine garter snakes are quite as easy to, to come by on, on that side than they are. Well, they, the they, US, they're but... very, very widely uh, captive bred in, in Europe now. Um, uh, see, in Europe, we, we have this weird thing where we seem to push everybody into getting kind of like a corn snake or, 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 a, a, royal. Or, or a royal python, which are ball, yeah, python ball python for python. Americans. Um, again, that's a bit of a bone of attention. But, <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> we, um, we, um, we push everybody down. It seems like everybody gets pushed down this, this one path. That's and the same with lizards like, as well. Yes, um, the typical leopard gecko or bearded dragon is always the same starters. Yeah, it, well, even the, you know, you, you, you walk through reptile shows now and it's at least the ones I've been to in the U.S. And I'm, I'm sure that places like Ham and Houghton are a little bit more interesting. But in the U.S., it is you know row after row after row of ball pythons and leopard geckos and. I know it's the same. And... It's this, everybody says Ham and Houghton's this this amazing thing for Europe for reptile shows in Europe. It's actually the same. There's lots and lots of rows of royals, leopard geckos, crested geckos, corn oh. snake, lots of rows of. They, the stuff that they know that will will sell, yeah. and, well, you know, and it's always moths, always moths. Yeah, well, yeah, and and that's something that I, 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 I find it impossible to, to get excited about the morph thing. I, uh, I, I like, if anything, I guess I like exceptional examples of normal color. I mean, there, there's there's really you're really hard pressed to find any snake that's more beautiful than a wild type corn snake, and why? Yeah, I fully agree with. Really, Right. Yeah, why yeah, they have the wild types? Yeah, I mean the the colors being selectively bred out of them. Uh, it, it, I don't quite understand how that works, and and so I've, I've I've kind of you know walking through those shows, I actively avoid those. And one of the really interesting things that I discovered after I moved here is you know I, I would avoid boas as well. So boa constrictor, boa imperator, I would kind of actively avoid those. And I'm you know they're just too common. There's too many of them. And yet now when I, I find wild ones, I lose my mind. There's something something very, very special about, you know, just walking down the road and, you know, there's a there's a boa crawling across the road or in my yard or in but a tree. I think, or, but I think could that you're be You're talking to two Brits are, here. Um, <laughs> we don't I mean, <laughs> if we saw a wild snake, it's, it's mind-blowing. And oh, no. here you are saying, like, oh, there's a boa in the garden. <laughs> Oh, well, so those are the ones I get excited about. And a couple of uh, – last time I was in Africa, in Guinea, uh, on the grounds of the clinic where we were camped out for a couple of weeks, they found a baby ball python. And somewhere in my Facebook history, there's a picture of that floating around. And ball pythons are another one. I just – you know, I'm happy to kind of avoid. But you see a, this beautiful wild one in its natural habitat, uh, and, you know, it's just magical. It's just was magical. it in a termite man by any chance? Uh, no, it wasn't, but it was in an area that was – it was actually in a, a fairly developed uh, – developed by West African standards, um, you know, medical compound, uh, yeah. which means it was, it was still essentially a rural area with buildings on it. Yeah. But it had um, – you know, it was a fairly large, sprawling complex of offices and other buildings. Uh, but snakes are so common in that part of the tropics. I mean, on the property, there's gaboon vipers and – and green mambas and and ball pythons and and all kinds of other stuff. So uh, it, it's not at all uncommon to f- to find things on the grounds of the clinic that are the species responsible for the bites that they're treating inside. Yeah. So it's it was really 
magical, but to see those common species in their natural habitat and not have to think about, well, you know, what kind of morph is this or how much is it worth or, you know, I th- think it's been, like too much has been made recently, uh, well, in herpiculture and in the hobby of, of how much an animal's worth, not how an animal would naturally live. The reason that a lot of us keep these things is because we're so fascinated by by the kind of natural history of it all and kind of snakes, how does something live without any legs? It's, it's kind of amazing. And then we kind of forget that when money comes into it. And I think when you look at the morphs and everything and when you're saying you're seeing boas in, you're walking down the street and you're seeing a boa uh, in, per, in per, uh, I can't spit my words out. Uh, you're seeing a boa constrictor going across the road in front of you. Kind of, it brings it back that actually seeing something in a drawer or seeing something in a, in, a, in an enclosure actually is in a bare enclosure kind of isn't doesn't give you the same feel. It doesn't it doesn't give you the same. And actually, kind of for me, it kind of makes me think actually it, is me keeping privately good or not? Is it is there a actually is there a kind of a moral thing there that we we need to look at ourselves and kind of understand why ourselves why we're keeping and stuff. It kind of yeah. it's really quite interesting to hear you say that actually. It, it, well, there, there's probably a whole other discussion about that, but oh, there I is. Yeah. For me, yeah, I mean, I don't. And I, while I'm here, I've uh, you know, if if I happen to come across some exceptional specimen or I get called to remove something, and for some reason it's it's exceptional. Um, some of those I'll hang on to for a while. For the most part, I'll I'll catch things and you know collect some data, film them, photograph them, release them. Um, occasionally, though, we come across something that's really, uh, really exceptional. Uh, the other night, I happened across a cat-eyed snake that turns out that it might be the first one of the species found in Costa Rica, and that's that's sitting two feet from me on that on my desk right now. Um, and I, you know, another night I was. Uh, just in a, a bad mood for for whatever reason i decided i'm getting out of here i'm going to go for a walk and you know 20 minutes later i find a beautiful coral snake we have a uh, a species here called Microsmos moscatensis which is a i think it's the prettiest of the costa rican species uh, of coral snakes and they're super abundant uh, right around the house uh, but even to see a common snake in the wild was enough to completely flip my mood and i had a great rest of the night and uh, so I just, you know, I, I love those. It, it's a passion, though. And to be able to see the animal you're passionate about doing what it does best in nature, there's n- nothing beats it. Oh, yeah. Nothing can beat it. And it's like Ross said, you, sh- you can keep your animal in a rack or whatever, but does it really thrive to the best of its ability when you could have it in a big display case and see it naturally behaving? nothing yeah. compares to it and i mean I, I had the same when i was in south africa seeing some of the the reptiles in their natural environment it just it it's something else you can't put it into words and the way it, it flipped your mood it says it all yeah well it's and, and i have to even kind of watch myself because i do have a uh, a bias that i have to keep in check where i like new things i like uh rare things i like things that i don't see all the time um, and if there's something that I see commonly, it's pretty hard to get excited about it. Um, and we have, you know, a lot of people come down and we'll go road cruising or we'll go out and hike in the forest. And they'll see something and say, oh, my God, what is this? What is this? And I say, well, that's a, oh, that's a coffee snake. They'll, you know, they'll throw away a leaf litter snake here. And, 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 and I find myself, you know, being dismissive about things that somebody else has never seen before or, you know, something like these cat-eyed snakes that are, you know, they're super, super common snakes. Um, and they're they're hard to get excited about. And they, you know, their musk is terrible and they smell like nuclear waste. And they're just, you know, they're really, they're, they're really, um, you know, if you've, if you've become accustomed to them, I guess, or if you've become dull to them, it's not as exciting. But to see when people come and visit and they say, oh, I've never seen you know, that species of coral snake before. I've never seen a wild boa before. I've never seen a, uh, never seen a, you know, an eight foot tiger rat snake in the wild or you know, it's crazy things like this that you sometimes see in the pet trade. Uh, you know, to just see it crossing the road in the middle of the afternoon or in the middle of the night. Yeah, you know, there's mm. nothing like that. Uh, there isn't. So if we move this on a little bit, how did you go from having this passion as a child to into, into the professional herpetological field? 
Well, um, accidentally, I guess the way a lot of us do, uh, we, we, we accidentally either fall into or invent a little niche to work in. Um, and growing up, I, you know, I, I kept these animals all the time. I wasn't really uh, part of the herp community at large. Um, you know, I would, I would join and leave herp societies and things like that, but I never, never really got too attached to it until um, around 2010 when I really got uh, the itch to, to do a, a film project. And I, I, I become frustrated with the way that uh, reptiles, and especially venomous reptiles, were dealt with in the media, and the people who work with them are mischaracterized. And I, I started to think, well, you know, if, you know, these things make up a lot of wildlife programming, and so they must be interesting. But if they're so interesting, why are they fictionalized so badly? Um, and so the, I guess the hypothesis I kind of wanted to test was, well, are these things interesting? And is the work around these things interesting all by itself? If you don't fictionalize it, is it still cool? And so that's kind of how the Venom Interviews was born. Um, and that, uh, that really is the project that consumed my life. Uh, and that's kind of the project that, um, I guess forced me to engage with the, the community at large and, in, in particular with the professional community, but the, the lines between the professional and scientific community and the private sector are not, those are not real sharp lines. They overlap a lot. And so, you know, now we find ourselves uh, nine years later and the Venom Interviews group on Facebook has got, I think it's close to 10,000 members or something now. And... One of the better groups. for oh, Venom well, thank you. Are definitely one of the better groups. There thank are so you. many, so many Venomous Reptile groups that, are just about, as, as we've spoken before, kind of who's got the most expensive thing. But the Venom interviews kind of, it talks about a lot of different topics. There's a lot of different interesting papers, different interesting articles on there that people post. And it seemed to be a lot more professional than a lot of the other the other groups. And I personally, I, I love that side of that group. Oh, thank you. That it's, it really is meant to be uh, focused on, Focused on and limited to the scientific and professional, and sometimes the legal aspects of venomous herpetology, and it takes some curation to keep it focused on that. Uh, you know, occasionally we'll get things that are related to non-venomous stuff, or generous, uh, you know, general herpetology, or frogs, or something. And those, you know, I I, I put those out, and uh, and I, I tend to have a pretty short fuse for people getting into you know, bar fights in the group about anything. So, uh, you know, I, we have a really good, uh, a good core group of members on the site, and the information that flows through the site is just, is phenomenal. I, I can't, I, I can't even measure how much I've learned just as a kind of a riding along as a passenger in my own group. Yeah, I think, I, I think that's something that, uh, I've I've found as well with with uh, being part of the a hobby side uh, kind of husbandry face one of the big of husbandry based Facebook groups as well is I've learned so much from just people putting stuff in there and kind of actually reading what people are doing and kind of and stuff like that and it's kind of it's been pretty amazing to actually see and see things develop from a husbandry standpoint for private keeping let alone from a venom research standpoint and stuff which we at the minute is is kind of very very fast paced it seems right now it is it is yeah. there's a lot of different lines of research well you you would see it uh, at liverpool all the the things that are going on uh and then there the lines of research that are you know in pain management or cancer or um alzheimer's or multiple sclerosis or uh, the all drug the other... discovery at the moment is is phenomenal um yes and well, it, it's it's never ending it, it seems to just constantly be the tip of the iceberg but the tip of the iceberg never seems to kind of go further than the tip that just grows and we yeah, know well, there's the... so much more below it we just every time we discover something more it, there's so much more below it that we just haven't worked out yet and the next 10 20 years is going to be phenomenal well, really one is. of the things i think that's really that is especially interesting to me about it is the rate of tool development in that you, you have analytical tools and and uh, and capabilities to to make discoveries that we didn't have 20 and 30 years ago. And those tools are going to get better. Uh, you know, you couldn't yeah. cheaply, you couldn't 
cheaply sequence the genome of a, you know, of a, of a entire snake for a couple of hundred dollars um, 20 years ago. I was going to say, it's now regular for us at uh, LSTM. I mean, we're not doing it so much now, but the, the amount of proteomic and transcriptome data we've got, we've currently got um, an Italian intern who's over six months. And what she's doing is literally going through files and files of this transcriptome data, just working it through. And it, it is amazing the amount of data we've got and how easily accessible it is for us now. And 10 years down the line, five years down the line, that's already going to have increased. God knows how yeah. much. And yeah. it will become second-rate data at this point that 10 years down the line, we might have so much more in depth. Um, I, I can foresee a time when, you know, as, the, as that kind of work becomes faster and cheaper and new tools emerge that allow you to even... Uh, you know, discover things that you can't discover now, or measure things, or analyze things that, you, that aren't so easy to do now. Mm. That the problem will—I I predict that the, the emergent problem will be: okay, now we can collect so much data, we, have, we can collect so much more data than we're able to consume, and we have to prioritize how we sift through it. Um, so you're almost going to be mining a pool of data for for useful, uh, you know, useful research leads. Yeah, I think we're probably not too far from that. I, well, I don't know. What do you? What is your perspective at Liverpool? Do you think we're close to that um, already? Well, the running joke at the moment is um, that Rob and Nick, the the heads of the department, uh, are kind of trying to write us out. Me, me and Paul out of a job in about twenty years, and we've got a postdoc <laughs> who's uh, Stu, and he's recently writing um, a grant application. And it's to do with uh, bacterial recombinant uh, antibodies and stuff. And the running joke is he's trying to write us out of a job in 10. Um, wow. And, I mean, this is this is it. We're already at a stage where they've they've developed, um, I think it's bacterial recombinant, almost like how they produce in, uh, insulin. Um, yeah. But it, it's just so expensive. But like you said, once it's refined and once it becomes common practice, that price will drop massively. And if we can start making bacteria produce antibodies – and antivenoms, we, we're going to be laughing. I mean, that that really be... is a game changer. If, if something yeah. like that were to prove out, that would be, I mean, that would be the, the, probably it would be, well, without a doubt, the biggest change in in the way antivenom, not just produced, but the way antivenom is imagined, it would be the biggest mm-hmm. change since the time it was first created over 100 years ago. Yeah, it's not changed in 120 years, and we're now at a stage where we're looking at so many different avenues um, like some of the work that we've focused on isn't antivenom based, it's stuff like inhibitors and using drugs that have already been approved for other uses and we're finding that these inhibitors uh, are exceeding what we could ever think We um, in the preclinical work we, we're expecting um, like the mice to die quite quickly and then suddenly they're surviving overnight and all of us are in this, this shock state of, hang on, this is almost working too good. Um, and as it as it develops, like you say, we're just taking, it's not even little steps now, it's almost like leaps into new areas that we haven't seen before. And it, it's only going to get better. Well, I, I, I certainly certainly hope so. I mean, the, the whole developing world, uh, I mean, well, you're working on the project, so you know how, how badly they need it. Mm. Yeah, um, it is something that the collaborations across the world are doing, um, and they're all working so well together. It, it's one of the reasons that I was really happy to hear Ross was looking at doing this. Is simply stuff that, I mean, what we know at LSTM and other collaborations in, say, the Netherlands and Australia and stuff. What is almost common knowledge for us is just not filtered down to a level which is accessible to a lot of. Uh, private keepers and one of the the things we're, we're looking at is more public engagement to just to kind of get the word out because a lot of people don't even know there's a snake bite crisis let alone yeah. a shortage of antivenom or the sheer number of people dying or the sheer number of people being bitten um, so even like uh, the WHO recognizing it as a neglected tropical disease now 
that is going to help. Uh, it's, it's invaluable. And getting more and more governmental support and more and more grants opening up, people off, like offering money instead of us chasing grants. Um, my yeah. department at LSTM, when I started just over a year ago, um, I think there's about six or seven of us. We're now at, I think we're about nearly 20. And that's kind of the rate of growth we've had in one department. We've gone from a unit to a center and all sorts. Uh, um, uh, as you've said, Ed, like this is the, one of the reasons why we, we've, we've done this is the fact I, I came to you and I said kind of we were talking about things and I, and I have a slight interest obviously being a, being a private keeper, I have a slight interest in uh, in toxicology and, and the kind of we were talking and kind of like, well, there's, I found out so much information by just talking to you and talking to a few other people just like, the, the general hobbyist doesn't know this stuff and doesn't realise that this stuff's happening in the background and that, so why <laughs> but there's no platform or outreach programme to help people, help people uh, understand where the information is available and, and learn about it. So we decided that we were going to do this, and it kind of, obviously, you did that with 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 the venom interviews, and we kind of, if people don't know about the venom interviews, they they obviously won't won't have chance to see it. But like with yeah. the podcast, we're trying to trying to make it into little tiny snippets where people can just come in, understand little bits of information, and pull it to, and pull it away. Um, and hopefully, hopefully it will take off. We think we're doing quite well so far. And, and obviously having guests like yourself on to come and talk about these issues and talk about things that you've done and how and and how that actually relates back to hobbyists and such forth, it makes a big difference. Like these little bits of information make a big difference in just people's issues. I think so. Issues. It's also yeah, takes so. that away from um, published papers. And I feel like, especially for me, before I got into this field, published papers, they were a bit daunting there's usually technical terms and I'll be honest most of them are quite boring once you get into them um, you find the odd few that are fascinating well I personally find fascinating and being able to disseminate that information into um, into more of a, an accessible manner will, will help massively because I, I mean some of the papers I've seen that page is long with all these like um, as Paul refers to them, Tetris block proteins and stuff, um, and like your three finger toxins and stuff. Being able to take all that information, condense it into something that's that's easier to understand and not pages and pages of reading, will really help. And it will it will make this um, the whole kind of issue more accessible to everyone. And hopefully, they can realise that you know. Keeping venomous snakes, yeah. I mean, I don't think I could ever go back to not working around venomous snakes after after my experience at LSEM, simply because I know that is my passion. That's it. The venomous snakes are are it, and I'm sure both of you can agree. There's there's nothing else like working with them. But when you when you need to um, kind of talk to private keepers, you don't have that same view of the the world issue and stuff like that it it then becomes a bit difficult to have a, a dialogue where i i can fully understand why people would keep privately and i mean if i if i did unfortunately lose my job i might follow the avenue to keep privately just because of my my sheer interest into venomous snakes but i'm also fully aware of the world issue so um like we mentioned before on the podcast how the uh, how health services will stockpile antivenom that could be used to treat people who unintentionally are bitten, say yeah. in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, so for me, that would then change my view on what I keep, how I keep. So I'd probably go for a, a species that doesn't need the antivenom that could be kept out in another country, just so I'm not yeah. kind of yeah. contributing in a sense to for the shortage and. Um, it's definitely something I've noticed through interacting with people that they don't really have a need to think of, hang on, if I've got this snake and I'm bitten, that antivenom now isn't available. I mean, you don't really need to think about that. You wouldn't. It's, it's just there. For us, it's yeah. at, our, at our health service. Um, so 
I'm sure you've got a lot of stories around that from all the, the experience oh, you've got. Yeah, well, the, the, I, know, I know that the situation in, in mainland Europe and in the UK is a little bit different from how it is in the US. Um, and I, I think that there are some national programs. I mean, not just the fact that you have civilized health care, which the US doesn't, you know, from a business standpoint, the US doesn't have a working system. But um, aside from, from that, uh, exotic antivenom in the U.S., uh, it, it's possible, but it's difficult and expensive for private keepers to import it. Uh, but they can pool their resources. And, you know, let's say there's a group of people in San Antonio, Texas, or in Miami uh, that are all, uh, you know, working with similar species. So they can stockpile antivenom that is for the group to share in the event of an emergency. And that's actually how Venom 1 started in Florida. It started out as a collective like that. But the vast majority of venomous keepers don't have any idea where their antivenom is coming from. Uh, they're certainly not stocking it themselves. Um, some of them believe that a hospital might stock it, which is not the case for exotic antivenoms. Uh, so what happens is they end up, you know, they have an accident at 2 o'clock in the morning, and they end up raiding the fridge at the closest zoo. Um, and all of the scrambling that has to happen to get that antivenom where it needs to be, you know, that, that could all be mitigated by some better preparation. But the, I, I think in too many cases, the, the planning doesn't go any farther than acquiring and housing the snake. It doesn't extend to, uh, in the private sector, it doesn't extend uh, very well to emergency protocols. And there are plenty of exceptions to that. I don't want to discount the people who, who do it right but I wish that percentage were bigger than it is. There's too many people relying on zoos, and I try to make the point that you know the zoo's antivenom is for their people. It's not. It's not yours to take. Um, that's that's a hard message to get across. No, no, no doubt, no doubt. Now I think that in Europe it, it's very much seen as it's not your issue, and I think that can sometimes come across um, in by situations. People just just as you say, they don't. They their bite protocols are non-existent or they're very, very limited. Even though that there is some good quality bite protocols out there that uh, that you you can buy, you can purchase, or you can um, you can write yourself and get the information and write yourself. And people just don't do it, and I think it's a bit of a shame when that happens because in yeah. a, in a bite in a bite situation you. If you've got no bite protocols or or you don't under, fully understand exactly what you need to do, where you need to go, and it, it's a life or death situation. It doesn't matter what snake bit you at the end of the day. When you're dead, you're dead. It's yeah. Well, it, one of the things that was really that was really driven home to me in the discussions with um, all of the people who are at an occupational risk of being bitten is how critically important their relationship with their emergency room team is, their personal physicians. Um, you know, the, the ER docs that are going to do the work of keeping them alive if, if they have an accident. Um, you, you can have all the protocols you want, but if you haven't reviewed that with a doctor who's agreed to follow it, it's just a piece of paper. And it, it, it it's not going to carry any weight unless you've got an agreement before an accident happens that they're going to follow it and use it. Um, you know, the, if you haven't agreed on that in advance, they're going to do what they feel is is best and depending on whether the doctor has a lot of experience with snake bite or not you know that that you may have a very easy time of it or you you might be in for a, a rough ride so the importance of making those arrangements in advance it just it just can't be overstated and following on from that i mean if you buy a protocol all our protocols at lsm paul was very central of writing he and rob worked together and all our protocols are very common sense based very how pool works and it's not this idea of a generic protocol pool is central in the making of the protocols and for me to come into this facility it we aren't in a position where we're having to to change how we work to meet a protocol it it flows with how we work and that means that we're not doing this kind of oh i better make sure i've, I've ticked this off it's something that comes so naturally in it allows us to, to work to our potential without having to worry about this kind of, oh, this protocol says I've got to do that. It's, well, I work like this. How can I work a protocol around that? So yeah. 
Um, well, if you, you buy you any groceries... Go oh, no, go ahead, go ahead. I didn't mean to cut you off. Oh. Um, I was just going to say, like, if you buy in a protocol, it's great that you've got that backbone, but if you go through and review it for your own situation and have a little tweak of it, even that will kind of allow you to work through it and say, hang on, that might work for, for example, a bigger facility, but mine is slightly different. Oh, this is implying that the hospital is X miles away, whereas mine is this, and... Um, it could be saying, oh, you need to contact so-and-so, but so-and-so wouldn't be practical for you. So being involved in tweaking your own protocols is, is such a useful tool to, to just making the keeping that you're doing safer for you. Um, and it allows you to kind of have less of a worry and more concentration on what you're doing. Yeah, well, it's, um, it's, it's just knowing that you have those bases covered it gives you some peace of mind. Definitely does. Um, now, I would go back to one thing that you you, you said uh, earlier when you talk about deciding, you know, which animals to keep. Um, the that decision making process is often uh, about how beautiful the animal is or how cool the animal is. It it doesn't it's always very impulsive. It's a very impulsive mm. decision. It, or it, well, I know for me it was originally. Yeah, you know, you have people whose starter venomous snakes are something like you know gavoon vipers or. Uh, you know, king cobras. A king cobra is a is a potentially terrifying animal. That's a that is a formidable opponent. If it if it doesn't want to be you know, if it doesn't want to be worked with, um, if it doesn't want to play ball, it won't play ball. The king cobra, oh, yeah. is, it, it knows. It's the same with mambas. It's the same with cobras. They know their potential. Yeah, and no, you know, I and they I, won't let you mess even, about. Well, and and those are snakes that I'm you know I'm very comfortable to be around. Um, I'm not as comfortable handling those because I, you know, I, I haven't worked with a lot of big elapids, Um and I'm very comfortable with large vipers. I'm comfortable with with both rops. I'm comfortable with, um, you know, any of the little vipers. I, you know, rattlesnakes I like a lot, um, and those I'm those I'm totally comfortable with. Um, but to to jump right into, uh, you know, a snake that can kill you in an hour. There's not many snakes that can do that. But to to jump right in and have the, uh, an animal like that before you're really ready to do it um i'm amazed how often that happens and it's it's pretty pretty unnerving definitely is i mean for me personally i i'm a big fan of my lapids i prefer the bigger lapids saying that i i also love little aspidib laps and stuff and i'm i mean if i didn't have to work with them for for the purpose of snake bite and at lsdm i would avoid vipers myself i don't have that much of an interest in them I enjoy them. I can appreciate their beauty. I can see why some people would love them. But for me, it, it's a snake I couldn't reason with. And I, I love the, the activity, the inquisitiveness, the the cognitive abilities of alapids and colubrids, which for, it's not for everyone. And I mean, like you say, coming up against a big alapid, I think that's one of the most amazing feelings. But then again, if you're being chased around the room by a big forest cobra, <laughs> you're not ready for it. It's it's yeah. something very different. Yeah, yeah. It, it, and having spent a, a ton of time with those uh, that class of elapids uh, in, for filming purposes and so forth, uh, man, I've seen some some wild things happen. I've seen some pretty amazing acrobatics, and and I I love them. I would love nothing more than to you know to work with king cobras in particular. That's just an amazing animal, but um, I don't. Ha- I, I know myself well enough to know that I don't. I don't have the e- experience to to deal with a 14 foot lapid. I I would need. I would need some. Uh, uh, I need to go back to to uh, to being a, uh, under a mentor to to feel comfortable to, to feel that I was doing that correctly. Um, and I know that some people feel just you know the other way around. They look at uh, these psychotic bothrops that lose their mind when you touch them and don't want to go anywhere near them and. Yeah, those I don't want to go near both ropes. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. I, and, and those I have a level of comfort with just, you know, by by exposure and experience. And so I, I think it comes down to what you spend your time with. I mean, we are talking Definitely. as professionals here where we have the ability to have interactions with large numbers of these animals. And then filtering that down to a private keeper, you might have seen a few videos and thought, oh, that looks great. Oh, that both ropes is beautiful. I, I wouldn't personally own a bothrops and if i didn't have to interact with them i wouldn't because i know their potential 
So uh, one, then... one of the uh, hosts on this show, he's got some um, Bothrops Mugenai in there. They're 1.7 meter animals, and they're, they're not fully grown yet, and they're, they're huge, and the, the venom on them's just oh, oh, it's, scary. It's really things awful stuff. Well, you and, saw at the in the venom interviews and in the outtakes, you see that Muji and I go flying off the the extraction yeah. table, um, and I was you know I was right next to the table, and I'm very happy it lunged the other way. But you know if that if that animal backs up against something, its range is is quite a lot more than the length of its body. Uh, and the acrobatics they can do are, you know, they're mm. really impressive. And if you're not prepared for that, uh, it's not an animal you want to be caught off guard by. No, they're definitely no. not, definitely not. So we're, we're, we've gone kind of slightly sidewards off topic, as I always. would probably say, as we always seem to do. But as we're this prone to. Yeah, the conversation's yeah. flowing, so I just don't like to uh, don't like to stop it. But ha- have you think you've seen an impact that uh, the Venom interviews has had as a documentary? Do you think there's been an impact on the private keeping sector from that, and people actually realising the work that these people do? Yeah, well, I, you know, I think well, I think to answer your question, yeah, there has been. I think it's satisfied uh, a great deal of curiosity that was. Um, I maybe I maybe among the larger herb community uh, or the, the larger venomous community, maybe there was some some interest that was dormant, or there was some interest to know more about the professional and scientific side of things, but it wasn't very accessible. Um, I mean, that was certainly the case with me. That's kind of the impetus for the for the project is I wanted to you know dig in and see the professional and scientific work, and um, and you know through through some combination of design and luck. I managed to get to, to spend a good amount of time with all the people I wanted to in the U.S. and Canada, um, and have spent a lot of time with them since you know since the inception of the the project. But I think what it really revealed, uh, much to my satisfaction, was this curiosity that was there in the community all along. And you know, I I really made the project, I, I made the film because it was the film I wanted to see that nobody was making. And it was just super exciting to see that a bunch of other people wanted to see that same kind of film. Um, and it's, it's, I think it's put, between the film and the group now that, that supports it, I think it's put a larger number of private keepers in closer touch with some of the uh, people who do professional or scientific work. Um, and so I think it's opened up a good bit more communication than there might have been uh, before that. Um, but I, I, don't, I don't know. I'm also uh, cognizant of the fact that I'm viewing the forest from inside it, so I have a biased view. Um, and from the outside, you know, somebody outside might be able to answer that better than I could or might have a, a different answer than I do. But I think to answer your question, um, yeah, definitely revealed a, a big interest. And I think based on what I've heard from a, a good number of people, it's caused them to reevaluate or re uh, you rethink how they how they think about the animals, which animals they they work with, um, how they think about safety in particular. That that comes up a lot. How they think about preparing for accidents um, that comes up a lot. So that part has probably been the most satisfying aspect is to see that kind of uh, that kind of engagement and to see people benefit from something that I really did as a kind of a selfish exercise. It was I made it because I wanted to see it. Yeah, it, it's it's a really interesting documentary. I just I, it goes to show kind of the thought processes and the work that these people, every all these people, put into actually understanding understanding the animals and the processes and everything that they're doing. It, it's it's the massive operation that these people these people run and are involved in, and it, it's pretty incredible to see. And that that platform definitely definitely gives uh, get, puts that forward. Uh, one and thing... it's hard. It's hard to make a living at it. It's yeah, uh, definitely. That's a definitely that's is. one thing that was really you know really driven home is you know you can have a warehouse you know full of king snakes breeding them for you know twenty dollars each, um, and that's hard work. And if you're in running a venom lab is that running a venom lab is so hard that it is essentially impossible. I mean the the venom labs that exist um, in academia it's a little bit different, but the private venom labs that exist in any capacity are just, uh, they're just such amazing exceptions 
to the rule. There's, there's, they've had to overcome so many things, uh, not the least of which are just the finances of, of getting a Venom Lab to be self-sustaining, let alone profitable. That's incredibly hard to do. It's a lot um, of work, yeah. but very little reward, isn't it? And yeah. At the end of the day, uh, it's... It, yeah, I mean, we're very lucky at LSTM because we are part of the university and the work that my department does within LSTM is is part of the whole ethos of what the School of Tropical Medicine is for. We are there to to work on the neglected tropical diseases. We are there for the the kind of poorest parts of the world to to offer a hand where it's not offered. And if it wasn't for the payoff in that sense and the actual benefit we've got on the ground, I, I don't think LSTM would be able to justify the costs of running the herpetarium. Oh, I'm sure in, that's in, I'm sure that's the case. In all honesty, we are probably a quite a big black hole in the in the the school's finances, where we suck in a hell of a lot of money, and without the grants that we have coming in, it it would be hard to justify keeping it running. I'm sure that's true of, of virtually every facility like that. Um, you know, even in in academia, there's mm. uh, there's just, there's, just uh, th- there's not a lot of ways to make money, um, you know, with, and, and I don't know if grants count as making money. They're uh, it's certainly consuming a lot. It's consuming uh, a lot of money, but <laughs> hopefully giving something back that someone deems worthy enough yeah, to, um, yeah. to kind of put their money into. And I think that actually speaks to a, a bigger point, that there has to be something more to it than money. You know, people who who have succeeded in, in setting up and running private Venom Labs uh, – they succeed largely on just ob- obsession. It's just, mm. it's a calling. It's, it's something that they just have to do. They can't not do it. And, you know, I, I have had that question a bunch of times. Well, you know, my property's a little crawling with venomous snakes. Well, why aren't you extracting venom from them? And that's just not my calling. That's not what I'm in business to do. And I've got a pretty good view now of what it takes to do that. And, and I know that that is a it would it would be like buying a boat. It would be something I just pour money into indefinitely. That's never going to yeah. never going to pay off. One of the things we see quite commonly is uh, people kind of ask. Well, not so much commonly, but it's it's cropped up quite a few times where people have said how they want to extract venom and sell it. But they don't really realize that it's not just a case of extracting the venom. It's the whole process and after. It, oh yeah, us, extracting the venom is a solved it. problem. That's yeah. It's, and you got to find it's somebody to the freeze buy it. drying is the the selling of it. It's like you say. There's there's very few places around the world that can afford to have a freeze dryer that's running to dry their venoms, to have the the appropriate scales, to have the appropriate equipment, the appropriate training, the appropriate facilities to to dry and produce this venom. And then you need a market for it. Which, if you're not accredited, if you haven't got a good record. People, in, especially in like an anti-venom community, who are producing, they're not going to come and buy your venom from Joe Bloggs, who lives in a flat, who's dried it in his kitchen. It's, yeah, <laughs> you need some yeah. sort of integrity behind it, and sure, it might be exhilarating to extract venom, but you might as well pour it down the sink. Yeah, no, really, it's it's not a the, the venom itself is not the precious resource with no. with a couple of a couple of exceptions, but the venom itself is. Is easy to come by. It's why labs have big inventories of venom that hasn't been sold. Uh, you know, getting the venom is is the easy part. Everything that comes after that is tough. Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, still, this is really, if, really if you interesting. Ever come around, that is, yeah. Yeah, this all this stuff that? is really interesting, and people, as as you say, people just don't realise that actually it's not what what it's made out to, what what people think it is it's not what people are made out of it and it's like you get people all the time uh, whenever you, like ed posts on on public forums and public groups on facebook um oh it's amazing you you must be so brave to work with these animals it must be so amazing to work with these animals but i think it becomes such a natural thing and stuff for these people to to do that all the time that actually that it's not what people make it out to be and then and then they all, all go, oh, yeah, but you must make loads of money to extracting the venom. It must be – it's like, no, actually, it's not It's not the case. It's it's yeah. not like that. And, it, and I say that's probably one of the biggest impacts probably doing the documentary 
it has on on the the watcher and obviously as yourself as the person who recorded it that actually these people are doing it because they're devoted to it they're not doing it because they because they're making money they're, they're just yeah wholeheartedly devoted to what they're doing and the causes yeah. that they're trying they're trying to supply the venom for or the yeah room. yeah and and it you know it's useful to, to keep in mind that in the u.s all of the private labs a hundred percent of them every single one uh the people who run the lab live on the property it's at their uh it's it's either at their home or their homes at the lab they're you know they're their home and work are one and the same. It's, uh, it's not a job, it's a lifestyle. That's oh, it, what I've always said. Yeah, very Working much with so. animals very is already so. uh, a lifestyle. It's not a job. Yes. But then on top of that, working in a venomous kind of collection. I mean, I live two miles away from my work. Um, Paul lives across the river in Liverpool. But he's not had a holiday, I think it's about seven years now. And oh we're in, yeah, I mean... He's very dedicated to his work. Um, and Paul and I are in most weekends because uh, we have to check the snakes every day. It, it's not a case of you can just come and go. You have to have that passion. You have to have that that burn to to do the job. It's, it's not money-making. It's not big salaries, despite what people might think. It It's literally you are doing this because you've got your passion, because it becomes your life. There's no other yeah, way to describe yeah. it. Um, and... Well, if they haven't, they haven't taken a vacation in so long, would, to, please pass on my invitation to, to Paul and to Nick and, and the whole team there. We have the, the Eurovenom uh, Herp Conference coming up in September in Slovakia. And everybody, should, if you haven't had a vacation, take a vacation and come to this conference. I think it's going to be fantastic. I think it's already uh, been discussed uh, a fair few times <laughs> between oh, the unit. Um, and I think a few people might look at presenting posters and stuff. Um, Excellent. The, un- the unit is very active across the world in different symposiums and stuff. Um, and I'm sure we could maybe talk Paul into taking some time off. <laughs> well, Hopefully hope. talk Tell- him in to take him yeah. some yeah, time Yeah, it's, it's more of a stay, case. It's not stay at home to... and he, he has to go then. Yeah, yeah, it's, just, it's more of a case of um, it's not Paul couldn't take a holiday. Well, he couldn't at, at some point. It's not more... He, it's more he doesn't want to because he, it, it's his life. For yeah. the past 26 years, he's worked there. It has been his whole life. Well, not his whole life, but at least half his life is dedicated to LSTM and looking after the snakes. And it, it does get to the point where, um, I know certainly from my previous job, where my animals were my animals. And I didn't want to leave them because not that someone wouldn't do a good job looking after them, but, you know, what happens, if they didn't it, uh, what happens if, you know, they didn't feed my animals at exactly the right time that I did? What happens if they didn't do the routine yeah. exactly how I did? Yeah. And that's did just you... one of the things. So while filming the Venom interviews, have you seen a lot of very similar traits in a lot of the people that, that do this for a living? Have you seen that they, there's some of these similar traits, I suppose? Um, I guess that's a good question. Um, and one of the questions... Uh, that toward the end of filming, uh, I was having, uh, I think I was having dinner or lunch with, uh, with Leslie Boyer, and she brought up this question. She said, okay, so what separates the people who have found a way to make a living in this, in this world uh, versus the ones who, who haven't or the ones who, who do it as a, an avocation or a hobby? And I became really fixated on that question because I didn't, that was a, uh, something I didn't have an answer for. Is what what determines what succeeds? And so I went back and I, I asked that question around a lot. And what came back uh, was that it's it's this this drive, uh, this obsession. Uh, I think Carl Barden was probably the first person who used that word obsession. That you have to be obsessed, and not just obsessed, but is obsessed in a way that uh, that drives you to make forward progress. That. Uh, that leads you to do things that are productive and valuable. Um, and then there's, there's other things. So reptile people in general are, I don't know if rep, people are reptile people because they're weird or people are weird because they're reptile people, but we tend not to play well with others uh, generally. We tend not to be really good at following rules as a group. We tend to be oddly socialized as a group. But the people who have um, managed to, to make a living at it 
uh, one of the the things that kind of differentiates them a little bit is they keep their um, you know their their oddness uh, under check enough that they can kind of follow systems of rules. They can you know they're willing to work within regulatory structures. They're willing to uh, you know pay their taxes and and run a run a successful business and uh, and things like that, which is no small feat. I think for a lot of us, a lot of us really don't don't like to be controlled very very tightly. But that is one thing they all seem to have in common. Uh, or maybe those are two things: is the the willingness to operate in some kind of structure uh, and to channel that that obsession into a productive path forward. Mm, definitely, definitely, it, it's it is a mentality, and it's not always easy to describe. But I mean, you just hit the nail on the head. I think um, that that basically sums it up from what my experience is. It's it's like my job is not playing with snakes as much as I'd love to be able to just play with most of the collection. I can't. Um, and I would love to be able to just get the odd cobra out and just have a little play around in the prep room or something like that. But you just can't, you have to separate that, that passion into another way. So if say uh, a certain snake needs cleaning, then, I might leave that one for last and yeah. spend a little bit more time with it. But still, it's a case of it's not what I want to do. It's what needs to be done for the facility. Yeah. And it's hard to have that, that discipline. I think we're, we're not all, uh, we don't always find it easy to be as disciplined as maybe, I don't know, maybe physicists or, or you know, chemical engineers or, <laughs> or something yeah. quite easier. Yeah. Maybe, maybe I am an engineer, easier. so uh, I, I am an engineer, and, and we also really struggle to keep things on task, and and <laughs> and now we're all we're all very odd again, oddly socialised, and engineers are quite oddly socialised and stuff. So, hence probably why I've got this uh, this this passion for uh, for venomous reptiles, probably. But uh, yeah, it, it, it's not just to not just just to, to that kind of field it, it seems to be across quite a few different fields that that, yeah. that kind of drive and that kind of determination is is, is there is definitely there so I think we'll um, I think we could move this conversation on uh, because it I think quite a lot of people now know Ray that you've you've since moved to Costa Rica yeah and, um, which sounds absolutely incredible seeing boas going across the road as you walk down the road that, that, yeah. that'd be heaven to me I think but, yeah uh, I'm the same boat as Ross there it, it'd be amazing yeah so, it, well it's, it's definitely uh, it, it's not the easiest uh, you know it's not the easiest place to live but it is probably the most fun so do you actually go out herping quite quite a considerable amount then? More than you probably should. <laughs> well, uh, you know, probably not as much as people think, but uh, I, I do try to go out, my, my wife and I try to go out every night and walk. Um, so what I, we find that when we go out looking for snakes, we don't find anything. So we go out every night not looking for snakes and, uh, you know, just for exercise. And find a cat yeah. snake in an area where it's not meant to be. So. Yeah. <laughs> so we, so we, we, we go out um, not looking for snakes, but at the but at the perfect time and in the perfect weather and the perfect location. And so as long as we pretend we're not looking for snakes, um, but I've always got a hook and bag with me. Uh, and I think we find, um, let's see, this week I found three, the coral snake and a little coffee snake and, this new leptodera, which is is kind of uh, that's kind of exciting, but I think we probably average uh, one or two snakes every other time we go out, and if we go out every night, we see a good number of snakes every week. If we're not prohibited by weather, sometimes you know if it's raining an inch an hour for for days at a time, it, we have a, a hard time getting out there. But there's a really interesting phenomenon that we've noticed where uh, if if it cools you know cools way off and it's super rainy for a couple of days. And then we have a suddenly dry, warm day. That is when my phone rings, and somebody says, oh, "I've got, you know, I've got a, a boa in the tree, or I've got a terciopelo in the garden, or I've got an eyelash viper on my propane tank, or I've got, um, you know, a tiger rat snake in my horse sta stables." And um, so that weather pattern has been pretty consistent. So 
you know, we get a bunch of rain, then it warms up real quick. I'm going out that night, and we will find stuff. That's uh, a tip for anybody going to Costa Rica. For her <laughs> yeah, yeah. Try to make sure that you schedule the rain correctly. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Costa Rica has seemed to have become becoming more and more popular as a holiday destination. I think there's been a a bit of a population rise there as well, hasn't there? And a bit of um, in, more encroachment into the rainforest that's there as well. Is there, has there been an impact on different biotopes and animal populations in there? Because I think I've read a paper about, I think it was about bothrops that actually they're adapting quite well to uh, city, well, to, to town and population boundaries and stuff. But obviously you may have a bit more first-hand experience with that. Well, uh, we have, so last time we moved, my wife found a, a tercio pillow under the, the dryer in the house. Um, and I'm, I'm perfectly happy to have both rips in the house, but I like to know that they're there. And I like to know, <laughs> yeah. I like to know that, that they are safely contained, uh, to find a, a wild free range, both rips in the, in the washroom is uh, a little bit unnerving, but yeah, there are, uh, bo- the both rips aspirins that we have here are, um, they are, you know, they're not common in the, the, in the city proper. So like in San Jose and, uh, you know, the very, you know, the concrete jungles in the middle of the country, they're not there, but they're in the immediate outskirts. And anything that approaches um, a less developed or rural area, they're a common snake. And they're they're very, very comfortable living around populated areas. Um, I find them here and right around where I live. Uh, the first house where we lived, uh, Bothrops were the most common species we found on the property. Oh, um, in including the young ones. Um, so we, we would find small ones with a you know yellow or green tail. So we had a breeding population of them on the property. And, you know, they're prolific snakes, 50, 60, 70 babies at a time. And uh, so they're, they're just incre- They're unstoppable. They're a they're super common, common animal. So have you, with how common they are, is, is there a, a snake bite issue in Costa Rica and in, in that area within, within, south america yeah so uh it, it does vary a little bit from country to country central america in general is pretty uh is pretty consistent in the number of bites um you know, so I, get, I think it hovers around eight or ten per hundred thousand per year uh and, but you have some outliers like so the data for panama is is, is a wild outlier and we think that's because the um, non-venomous bites are being counted and venomous bites are being counted more than once and then in like El Salvador, the number is lower than you would predict it to be, but that is probably a data issue, probably a reporting problem. But in Costa Rica, so Costa Rica has just uh, just short of five million people, I think. We have around five or six hundred bites a year, so right around that, that ten per hundred thousand uh, range. Um, and of all of the bites that we have, both drops probably account for. Um, of all the venomous bites we have, probably in the range of 70 to 80 percent of them. Uh, but of the bites that are fatal, uh, the large majority of those are, are Bothrops bites. Um, and uh, again, only uh, only about one percent of the Bothrops bites are fatal. We have about five fatalities a year on average. So five out of 500, about one percent of the bites in the country are fatal. But of the fatal bites, Bothrops accounts for uh, the decided majority of that and sometimes in in many years the entirety of it um that comes down to a few things they're you know they're they're big snakes uh they're very very nervous uh it's it's easy to flip their switch they're quick to bite uh they live in large numbers around people um and if you're doing the kind of things that put you at risk that's uh you know you could you could probably walk through gardens of full of coral snakes all the time and never get bitten of the Dozens of coral snakes I've worked with since I've been here. I've yet to have one even attempt to bite me. None of them, not a single one. Um, Bothrops are—they're um, a different—they're a different animal. They have—they have this reputation for being aggressive, which is—I uh, like to address this in presentations where I, um, or I teach people that that's not uh, aggression is probably the wrong way to characterize that animal's behavior. They are very nervous. They're very easily frightened, and uh, it's not a smart thing to do to terrorize or antagonize uh, an animal that can kill you, whether it's, you know, it's, uh, you know, large wildlife or big cats or anything, you know, you don't terrorize something that is easily frightened and can cost you a, an arm or a leg. Literally. It can only, it can only bite you 
if you're in a position for it to bite you. And, yeah. and if you're antagonizing it and you're poking it, you're trying to pick it up, instantly you are now at, at such a much higher risk oh, than yeah. if you are to see it go, oh, that's quite nice, and walk on. Yeah. It, yeah. You let, the risk factor is, is changes, but it's massive, isn't it? It's, oh, it, it is. And if you're – the the one point I really try to, to, to drive home to expand on what you just said about – you know, the only way you get bitten is to be close enough to be bitten. Well, there's only two ways you get close enough to be bitten. Either you're interacting with the animal intentionally to, to catch it or kill it, uh, or to piss it off to try to take a picture, uh, or you put your hands or feet unprotected where you can't see. And there's a few ways to do that. You can walk in high grass with unprotected feet. You can walk, walk in flip-flops at night with no light. Um, you can just simply not watch where your feet are going. And, but, if, but, but you have to do one of those things to get bitten. You have to either put your hands or your feet where you can't see, or you have to deliberately interact with the animal. If you don't do that, those two things, it's, it's essentially impossible to ever get bitten. Uh, and I, I certainly don't know of any case where somebody's been bitten doing something other than that. It's definitely something that um, I always try and convey when I'm, I'm doing tours around LSTM that, you hear a lot of stuff, especially about echis, that they're they're very aggressive snake. And something I always try and hammer home is, you've got a snake that's about thirty centimeters long. I, it's easily predated. It's it's not going to sit there sore scale in for ten minutes when you could easily pick it up and kill it. So they are yeah. very quick to react. Um, but it's never aggression. It's always defense. And always, I'm, yeah. I know you've got your examples of like forest cobras and stuff that will chase you, but even then, that seems to be a defensive manner of well, I've warned you. Now I'll I'll make you back off. Well, you've before. had to put that snake in a situation where it's had to do that to yeah. get you to back off. It's not like it's not going. You're not going to walk past a mamba, for instance, and it's going to chase you. Like this is this, we've, we've talked about this before. Obviously, in in South Africa, there's so many myths about. Black mambas really will is. rear up and chase you down the road as you're running away and stuff like that. They won't. Yeah. They'll disappear into the nearest crack or into the nearest bush or you somewhere you them. can't see it or it can't see you. And the reality of it is you're not going to have seen that it was there in the first place. Yeah. So you've got to be doing something and be somewhere that is that, that snake's got the chance to bite you in the first place. Yeah. Even in well, that... our facility. Um, so when Ross came to visit the other week... Um, how many snakes did you actually see? None, really. Pretty much, they all hide away, and that's that's it. That's that's the thing. I I always tell people, in all honesty, snakes are quite boring. They don't want to be around us; just want to hide. Yeah. And, and that is the natural behaviour of a snake. If you've got a snake that's constantly on the defence, then something's not right with it. They don't Unless want to be hidden. Malpolon never hide. Just, just well, yeah, you've got your, you've got a few uh, examples that don't, but the the grand, like the vast majority of our snakes, most of them you don't see. And touring the facility is kind of, this is a cage where we've got some cobras. You can't see them, but there's some cobras in there. Yeah. This is a cage where we've got some mambas. You can't see this mamba because it's always hiding. And I'm sure it's the same with you. Like trying. If you're going out looking for snakes, you won't find them because they'll probably disappear before you well, got close enough to find them. Well, especially if you're in an area which, like most of the country here, is pretty dense. Uh, you know, either ground cover, trees, bushes, you know, sometimes all grow together to one big tangle of, you know, of greenery. Um, and you know that for every step you take, for every snake you might find, you've just walked by a hundred that you you didn't you see. Never see. Yeah, yeah and I'm I'm always sometimes. Uh, vocally fascinated by you know, I wonder how many snakes we're walking past right now. I wonder how many snakes are within 50 feet of where we're standing right mm. now. And you're right. You just, you, when you find them, it's, you know, it's, it's due to more, more to luck and, you know, being at the right place at the right time. But that is uh, one of, one of the best feelings. Oh, okay. it is. I, I can't, the first time you ever find your first snake of a species that you've been looking for. And it, it's just, the best feeling. <laughs> well, you know, right. one of the, the, the things here that was really, really fun the first year or so I was here when, you know, everything I found was a lifer because I hadn't, uh, you know, I hadn't spent a lot of time herping in Costa Rica 
when we were visiting here before we moved. Um, so everything I found was a lifer. And then on top of that, the morphological variation within species is not very well documented in the country. So there are there are plenty of snakes that don't look like what you expect them to look like, especially among colubrids. Um, and so I would get, get calls to say, can you come pick up the snake? It's in my kitchen. Or can you come, uh, I've got this snake in a, a bucket that was in the yard. Can you come get it and show up? And they say, well, what is it? What is it? And I'd look at it and say, I, I don't know. I'm not sure, but let's let's figure it out. And then have to go and, and key it out uh, and, and figure out what it is. Um, and sometimes morphological variations, uh, they're just species that are very variable, like uh, bird snakes and eyelash vipers, incredibly variable snakes. Uh, and then sometimes there are variations geographically, like uh, our salmon-bellied racers, Mestigodryas. Um, from where I'm sitting now, pretty much everything to the east of me actually has a salmon belly. And everything to the west of me has a yellow belly or cream-colored belly. It's still a salmon-bellied racer, at least as they're classified today. But if you, if the key you're looking for is a salmon-colored belly, you're going to be thrown by seeing an animal that's not the color it's supposed to be. And that's something you see in a, in a lot of snakes. I think, um, uh, well, definitely uh, Bitis aritans. Uh, Bitis oh, aritans. Yeah, like, yeah. Like, yeah. Oh, they are so variable and they're so, like, if just from localities that are miles apart from each other and they're just massively different and if you're trying to key them against what the key for that country for that species is you half the time you're not going to get the right species yeah it, it's it mad. Is really and that's a species that is fairly well documented um so if you have you imagine the colubrids here that are harmless that don't uh, they don't attract any research attention or they don't attract um you know there hasn't been a uh, Tuan Leaners is, is putting together a new book for Costa Rica, which I think is gone. I think it's gone to publishing now. So I'm, everybody's really looking forward to to seeing that new book come out. But before that, the you know the the reference uh, for the country, the go to, was Savage's book, the Amphibians and Reptiles of Costa Rica, and that book is is old enough that at least among the snakes, I think twenty twenty five percent of the taxons have changed. Um, a lot of the species names have changed, but even some of the genera have changed uh, okay. since that book was published. And and that's a that's a phenomenal book. But we know more about uh, you know we have more range data now than than we did uh, when that was last published. Um, and there's certainly, especially with the the advent of digital cameras and now and now camera phones, there's a lot more good quality documentation of the morphological variation within species around the country. And so you'll get, um, somebody will send a picture of something that would probably never have been documented. Like, for example, I got a, a picture from uh, uh, 40 miles from here. Somebody found this snake and couldn't figure out what it was. And they sent it to somebody who sent it to me. And I just jumped out of my chair. I was like, oh my God, that's, a, that's an anerythristic coral snake. It's a coral snake without red pigment, which is an incredibly rare you know, occasionally you'll find melanistic corals or albino corals, but for coral to be missing red pigment is a really rare, really rare thing to happen. Um, but, you know, we, we found one. And so occasionally you find things that don't look like you expect them to look, and that can be a really special challenge. Uh, that'd uh, be amazing. <laughs> oh, yeah. Just just having that chance that you have where, like, where you live, just to, to see this and to, to do that, that'd just be absolutely incredible. It's Yeah. Well, I, I tell you one event that happened so yesterday. So day before yesterday, I picked up this coral snake uh, when I went for my night walk. Uh, in the area where I am, this uh, Mycurius moscatensis is this very, very common coral snake. They're not very big. They top out about um, 70 centimeters, maybe 80 centimeters is a, is a pretty big one. Uh, but they're a real pretty snake. They look just like you expect a coral snake to look. Um, but we also have a couple of harmless mimics. One of those mimics is a snake called Scaphiodontophus. In, in the, the references, it, it used to be Scaphiodontophus annulatus. It's now Venustissimus. But in any case, it is a harmless colubrid that looks, uh, at first glance, it looks almost indistinguishable from, uh, from this Mycurus, unless you know exactly what you're looking for. It has red and yellow and black bands in the same pattern. 
So the rules about red touching yellow that you hear up in the U.S., that is not reliable in any country in Latin America. Um, maybe the exception of Chile. Chile doesn't have any coral snakes or any venomous snakes of any importance. But all of the other countries that have coral snakes, that they also have uh, coral snakes that don't follow what appear to be the typical rule, or they have colubrids that do follow what people often think is is the you know what coral snakes should look like. And so this one, uh, I was sent a picture yesterday morning of this snake, and I've, I just came out of my skin, okay, get that snake, get it for me, get it for me, get it for me. And the groundskeeper accidentally killed it. So I persuaded the, the person who, whose property it was, can, can you please put that in the freezer for me? Can, and she did, and so I went and picked that up yesterday, and so I've got that in the freezer, and I'll, I'll manage to get some good pictures of it. But it's, it's really useful when you have two species, you know, one of which is potentially dangerous and one of which is totally harmless, and they look very, very similar for me to get specimens of those that I can take good close-up pictures and be able to teach people, here's the things you look for. And they're, if you know what you're looking for, they're easy species to differentiate. Uh, but if you don't look, know what you're looking for, they might as well be the same animal. Yeah, the, if, yeah, definitely. It's, it's, it's mad, isn't it? it? It genuinely is crazy how little we actually know and how, li how little and what new stuff is coming all the time. And obviously you say what, what variation there is in, in what's meant to be the same species is, is, is just absolutely crazy. Yeah. I think because um, I, I am I'm watching the time go by and it's and it, just so easy to listen to you to be perfectly honest <laughs> it, um, you might have some editing to do you can cut out the, the boring no, parts no no I, I, to be honest none of this has been boring on my part definitely no, not none of it's been boring not. on my part and I think our listeners will feel the same as well um, so I think we'll we've, we've, we've covered quite a bit actually in Costa Rica and the Costa the herb fauna of Costa Rica and, and, and Central America the Central Americas um, so could you talk us a bit through a a bit more about through what you current the work you're actually currently doing with uh, in snake bite initiatives in in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, yeah, sure. So a couple of years ago, um, Leslie Boyer and I uh, started working on a project to produce training videos for doctors and nurses in sub-Saharan Africa to help them um, to help them treat snake bites. Um, so to put the to put the, the sub-Saharan African snake bite problem in perspective. Um, in the U.S., uh, if we use U.S. and Western Europe, is, uh, is a little bit different. Uh, you don't have quite the venomous snake um, variety and abundance that uh, the, the southern U.S. does. But the U.S. has, let's, let's say, six or 8,000 venomous bites a year, has uh, only about five deaths. So it's somewhere around one out of 1,000, one out of 1,500 bites is fatal in, in the U.S., um, and then to compare that to, to where I am now, um, we also have about five or six deaths a year, but we have one seventieth the population. So the way that breaks down is we have about um, about seven times the number of bites per capita, and of the people who are bitten, about ten times as many are fatal. But still, Costa Rica is the snake bite problem is not what you'd call uh, especially severe. It's fairly well managed. Most of the bites. You know, even uh, even among both reps, 99% of the bites are survived. Um, but I mean, even so, we've also it's... got the ICP there, and yes, they so do a lot of our... collaborations with us. Um, they do, they and... do all and all over the world. Yeah, um, um, but you can still they say are that fantastic. Yeah, they what really they do. And, and they're good people. They're really definitely. But to uh, to back to kind of put a scale on the Africa problem. So if, if Costa Rica is uh, say, 70 times the snake bite problem that the U.S. is. Africa, we don't have a lot of good epidemiological data, but it is probably somewhere around two or 3,000 times the magnitude of problem that is uh, that exists in the U.S. in terms of the number of people bitten and killed per capita in sub-Saharan Africa. It's, it's not 100 times worse or 1,000 times worse. It's between two and 3,000 times worse, depending on which you know, which data you, uh, you're basing that on and how you extrapolate it. Um, so the, the magnitude of the problem is just unbelievable. And it is largely a disease of poverty. So you look at, you know, the U.S., six or 8,000 bites a year, is, that's not insignificant, but nobody dies. 
in Africa, a lot of people die. The baseline fatality rate for people who reach the clinics, at least in the areas that we've uh, that we've worked in, it is somewhere around 20, 20 to 23, 25 percent. In some cases, uh, where there's a lot of elapids, there uh, the baseline fatality rate of people who show up to the clinics might be as high as 30 percent. Um, and that's just the people who make it to the clinic. And we think that there's probably, especially in the case of animals like mambas and forest cobras and uh, and other big elapids, that there's a sizable percentage that don't make it to the clinic. And that, now, those numbers are just sorry to the pause you for that there that that is just insane. Like it's, it's, it's hard the, to put it into words how though. bad that is, and and actually what what the situation is. It, it is the reality, and um, like you were saying there, we haven't got a lot of good data. One of the things LSTM is, has started doing is collaborations um, with uh, certain clinics in certain countries. So Kenya, Nigeria is a big focus for us. And one of the, the big things we're looking at is just trying to get accurate clinical data, which is we, sh- we don't know the numbers. And it's something that's come up with the WHO, with lots of snake bite initiatives. There's not one clear number. Because we yeah. just have no clue. And yeah, like I mean, you said, the amount of people who will just die without ever being counted that we won't yeah. know about that might have tried to get into hospital and died at the side of the road. Yeah. You, you will never know a true figure because it's the disease of poverty. Right. And, and what makes the difference is it's not, it's not so much the snakes. Um, you know, people are bitten where there are snakes, but people die where there are snakes in poverty. So yeah. the way, the easy way to describe it is that, you know, morbidity becomes mortality in the presence of poverty. Um, and they have, you know, you, you could argue that, well, Costa Rica has, you know, or, or I'm sorry, yeah, that sub-Saharan Africa has some really, really dangerous snakes. Well, it, it does, but so does Australia. And uh, Australia does a phenomenally good job of, of managing a snake bite from some snakes that are every bit as bad as what you find in in, uh, in Africa. Um, so it really is a problem of, uh, of training medical staff, of getting people to go to the clinics first, or at least quickly. Uh, if they're going to go to a traditional healer, uh, you want the healer to be on your side to, to redirect people to a clinic. If they recognize uh, symptoms of a bite that's going to progress very quickly, you want to get them to a, get them to a clinic as soon as possible because time matters a lot. Um, and then once they get there, there's got to be antivenom. And uh, in a lot of places, you know, finding antivenom is not a given. Even in, you know, fairly large medical centers, uh, it, they may or may not have antivenom on the day that, that you arrive. Um, and so, but, but what we have heard from the African Society of Entomology, who we're partnered with on the, the project, is that those numbers, those 20 to 30 percent fatality rates, uh, if you just add antivenom, it drops to about 10%. And if you add antivenom plus training on how to use the antivenom, it drops to about 2 or 3%. So it, you get a 90% reduction by just adding antivenom and training to the mix. So then the question is, okay, well, somebody's got to pay for it. Uh, antivenom's not free. It can be fairly inexpensive. But it's got to be produced. It's got to be produced against the right snakes. It's got to be delivered to the right area for those snakes. Um, Africa is an enormous place with a lot of geographical variation. So the antivenoms have to be the right ones in the, in the right areas. Um, and then people have to be taught to, uh, taught to use them. Those are enormous, you know, a continent of a billion people. Those are enormous problems to solve. But what we hope to do is to solve the educational part of that problem is to get uh, at least the first, uh, you know, the first step toward training uh, doctors and nurses to uh, to to be able to administer antivenom to recognize different syndromes that are associated with bites from different snakes. Um, so I'm sure you could in in the LSTM uh, exposure to to sub-Saharan Africa, you have physicians that you've seen that couldn't differentiate. Um, a forest cobra bite from a mamba bite based on yeah. its clinical symptoms um, or uh, an echis yeah. bite from a bitus bite based on its symptoms. A lot of um, what we, we are focusing on is, like you say, it, it's one of these things where you hear it from someone else working in a snake bite initiative where 
is down to education. A lot of people won't. Uh, it's something that I've just tried to say in other podcasts, but you you've worded it in such a way that exceeds what I've ever managed to do. Um, but one of the the biggest things that we're now focusing on is a lot of epidemiology and education. It, it's all good making antivenom, but if your doctors don't know how to administer it, your doctors don't know what to look for. You're you're not sure what you're doing with it. How is that helpful? Yeah. So we can or, we can produce the most amazing antivenoms. If yeah. your doctors can't administer them or they miss symptoms, it, you're still going to have a high fat, uh, fatality rate. Yeah. So going into the communities and um, even talking to the faith healers, like you say, um, I know that some of the Indian snake bite initiatives have gone into taught uh, snake uh, to faith healers, and they've they've said, look, if you see these symptoms, send them to the hospital because you know we don't want to take your business away from you. It's it's something ingrained in the culture. But yeah. Do you want these people to die on your watch because then that looks bad on you? And yeah. if you kind of flip it on that, like instead of saying, oh, you know, come to me, if you see say droopy eyelids, send them to a hospital because you can then turn around and say, you know what, this is out of my reach. And if that guy dies, it looks bad on me. Yes, yes. So and then what you're saying is, I think them. is, it is, I, I think what you're saying is, is really important because um, it is very common. In fact, it's been very common when I've done presentations about this in, in the U.S. And, and elsewhere where people say, well, you, you know, you, you've got to get them to bypass the healers. You've got to skip the healers and go straight to the hospital. Mm -hmm. And that is, uh, it's well-meaning, but it's naive. It's not, uh, when you have 100% of snake bitten people, go to a, uh, a healer first. Um, and really, this is, a, a, I think, an important point, that the people who are going to the healer, they're not making an irrational decision. Uh, a lot of people that go to the healers live, and that's the success criteria is that they don't die. Yeah. Um, and so a lot of the people, they either receive a venomous bite that would have been sublethal to begin with, or they receive a non-venomous bite, and they go to a, a, a traditional healer, and they are, they're quote-unquote cured, they're saved. The and then, stone and all of that, yeah. Right. But then you have people that go, well, you know, my, my brother, my uncle went to a, a hospital, and he died anyway, because he, he got there eight hours after the bite or 12 hours after the bite. And so there's, there is... Um, perhaps more confidence than there should be or than would be warranted by data in the traditional healers and less confidence than there should be in the, the proper clinics. But they, and you know, so superstition does have something to do with it. Um, they don't have the best data, but with the data that they have, they're making what really is not a totally irrational decision. They're, they're, they're making the best decision they can based on what they have. Um, and they may if not, we can, not have the money. If we can get people, like one of the things we've done is um, at LSTM is worked with uh, community volunteers, and we've kind of given them a bit more education. So um, instead of just saying, "Oh, you know, it's a bite, go straight to hospital," they can kind of not in a clinical sense, but they've got a bit more knowledge behind it. It's the same with the faith healers. If we can tell them, look out for these symptoms. We're not taking your business away from you. If you want to carry on, do it. It's not an issue. But if we can also get them to identify key symptoms where they say, you know what, this is out of my hands, go to a hospital, it reduces this, oh, we spent four hours traveling to a faith healer and then two hours of traveling to a hospital. It could be that you go to your local, uh, someone in the village, and they say, hang on, that's beyond a faith healer. And they can go directly to the hospital. It's, it's bypassing this this idea that you need to take the community out of it. You need to take yeah. the culture out of it. You need to work yeah. alongside the culture to, to gain trust. You Absolutely. can't just go into a, a tribal community and say, look, we know what's best. Uh, I know that this could be a bit touchy, but if you look at the past of, say, uh, a European intervention in a lot of these countries, it's not really the best no. so you're asking people to put your trust in certain people that they've got a good reason not to so working yes. in the communities and saying look people might not listen to us but they'll listen to you 
So if we train you to say, that's a symptom that needs to go to hospital, that's a symptom that can be a faith healer, that is building a lot of trust within the community. And if you get a respected person in the community like a faith healer or a tribal leader to, to work alongside you, you'll build these relationships up. And it's not something that can be solved overnight. It needs to be years of work put in. And that's where the snakebite initiatives are doing this, this groundbreaking work where it's not focused on just finding the treatment. It's working out the issues in the community, working with the community, building relationships that will ultimately save lives. Yes, yeah. Well, it's, it, it's kind of an interesting parallel. When we talked earlier about uh, people assuming that all you need to do to go into the venom business is to collect venom, uh, well, all you need to do is to treat snake bite is not just to produce antivenom. That's, that's a, a small part of a very large and complex and yeah. expensive problem. It really is. The, the antivenom is the treatment. Don't get me wrong, antivenom is so important that you can produce the best antivenom in the world. If no one's going to hospitals so they don't trust the hospitals or the last time they went, they yeah. couldn't afford the antivenom and it wasn't there. And uh, their cousin died last time they went to hospital, but their, their mum survived when they went to a faith healer. Yeah. Well, great, we've produced this antivenom and people are still dying. So yeah. the biggest thing is... It's a wider scope that we're all working on. And that's where this kind of interaction between people in Snakebite in initiatives is invaluable because it is raising awareness. The antivenom is invaluable. But if no one's using your antivenom, it, it amounts to nothing, really. You, people are really? still dying. Like, yeah, you've created the best antivenom that works on 20 species and all you need is one or two vials, like, that would be the dream. But yeah, well, it's like... to use it. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's like almost the equivalent of, well, I've got the best airbags in my car, but the car doesn't run. Yeah. So... It, it um, is. You need to be able to have all the elements working together to, to effectively build the trust in this product that you're making. Because there's, there is a lot of distrust towards Western medicine and antivenom because of the the cheap Indian antivenom and kind of the Indian subcontinent that are sending yes. over effectively crap antivenom. Well, it has no business being cheap. there. It's, it's yeah. not of any real use. And counterfeit antivenom. That's is, it. Uh, We've, there's so much distrust towards some of the product because of the snake bite crisis, because of the antivenom shortage, that you can't really blame people for almost rejecting it and turning to what they know culturally um, yeah. and it is working alongside these communities that need the intervention but almost people don't realize it's, it is more than just extracting some venom making some antivenom sending it um, the education behind it so telling people don't kill a snake because if you're killing a snake you're then in the strike range yeah how do you know that snake's dead you've got you can decapitate the snake but that head can still bite as yeah. uh, a nerve reaction for X amount of time after. So what yeah. are you going to do? You decapitate a puff adder. Great. So are you picking up the head straight away with your hands? Or are you then using a tool to move it? Or are you just going to leave the puff adder alone and it will do its thing? And um, you can teach them that puff adder is there because there is a food source for it. Yeah. So instead of killing the puff adder, why don't you work around removing the food source? Move the prey predator won't be there yeah they don't they don't want to bite us and that that no. is the biggest thing we need to change how the whole idea of snake bite works as well as try and treat it as well as try and educate it it's such a big scope that like hearing you talk about it has has given me a new perspective as well because of how you describe it in kind of a magnitude as well Again, a lot of people Throw figures. And throwing figures doesn't help. No, it doesn't. Um, you need to kind of have a way of talking about it. So using magnitude. I'm oh, sorry, Ross. Did you, fantastic. did you say something? I think was I lost it? you for a minute. No, I, I was going to, but then Ed kind of pulled it onto the point I was going, I was going to make. But hello? Ed, hello, can you hear me? Hello, hello? No, I can. Yeah, everyone's still here. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I, I, 
I think we, I, yeah. I can hear you now. I think I, I got nothing but silence for about 30 seconds there. <laughs> Sorry so, about that. Um, yeah, as, as Ed was saying, like, the, you've, you've put it in such a great way, like the order of magnitude to actually what what it is. When people say numbers, they just pass over your head unless you can realize, actually, you have a reference point for that number. And it, if you it, try it, to imagine 138,000 people, I, what's that to someone? Like, if you turn around um, and say, 10 people die, I know 10 people directly around my life, that's that's imaginable. A thousand people, well, that's, I can't really imagine that, but that's a big number. And then you start growing it like that, it, it suddenly loses the the impact it, as such, well, because you can't it imagine its it. It meaning, because you can't imagine yeah. it. You can't imagine it, yeah. The, and as you say, like, a lot of this stuff is... is it's a lot of it again is outreach again it's outreach to these people getting making people realize what the differences little differences they can do and they can make in their everyday life that could stop them being in a position where they're in in a position to be bitten by a snake it's yeah it, it's just it's absolutely incredible just actually having all of this put into perspective in a way that in a way that i i never could and, then, and to be honest, I never realised it, it's it's very eye opening. I knew the problem was bad, but you don't realise what how bad it was, how bad it is. It's, oh, definitely, definitely. Yeah. Until I started working at LSTM, I, I had no clue. I knew it was, I knew there was issues, but the more you kind of get into it and you actually see how much it impacts, even. So, um, so one of the things Rob took out to Kenya last time we went out was expired fat freak. And that is now being used as a backup in case there's a bite. Now to us, that fat freak just sits in a cold room. For them, that is invaluable. Yeah. And it, yeah. it's actually seeing how much they appreciate these little gestures that we can do easily. But to them, that is, that could save effectively three or four people. And yes. it, yeah. it's putting it into perspective of these little things that we take for granted is is life changing. Yeah. And the and outreach to see from it firsthand it is. Oh uh, yeah, definitely. I, it, there was the the first real exposure uh, on the first trip to Africa. We went to to Ghana and then you know, we drove over through Togo and then up into Benin. We spent um, I think about a week and a half up in the north part of Benin. In a, at this hospital in a town called Tangita. And, you know, we, we saw a bunch of patients, and we saw the, you know, puff adder patients and echis patients and um, gaboon patients and, and things like that. Um, and they were, you know, it was not um, in terms of the, you know, the, the patients were stable, um, but in some cases there was, you know, tragedy compounded upon tragedy. There was one woman, you know, she'd been bit by a puff adder, they test her, and then she's got malaria on top of that. Um, she's She's got two kids with her, one of whom she's nursing. This is in the hospital. Um, yeah. And, uh, you're talking about a level of hardship that none of us can even get our heads around. But one that really blew my mind is we've been filming all day at, at this hospital. And uh, we got back and you know got cleaned up, got all my data transferred off the cameras and got batteries charged and... About uh, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock that night, I got a bang on my door saying, we've got to go back. We've got a kid. He's been bitten. And we get back there. And this is actually the, the, the boy. If you see the uh, one of the introductory videos for the African Society of Entomology, you'll meet this uh, little boy. He's about 10 years old. His name is Weebo. And so we get there, and uh, he, he's you know, totally non-responsive. He uh, was bitten by uh, an Echisocelatus, a soft-scale viper. Uh, early in the morning, and I think, so that was about seven hours, and then it was about 11 o'clock at night, so we're, what, 16, 17 hours into the bite by the time we got back to the hospital. Um, he had been already given two vials of antivenom, wasn't responding, his blood still wouldn't coagulate, um, and like I say, he was totally non-responsive, and nobody was very optimistic that that was going to, that that was going to work out, and, you know, as a, a, a non-physician, to show up there, uh, there's something horrible and surreal about showing up there with lights and cameras with a kid to that film someone about to yeah, die effectively. Yeah, and that's you know that's what we what we assumed. Um, we had two more uh, vials of antivenom with us, so uh, those got administered, 
and about 30 minutes later, I mean, we, we were, were all fairly sure that he wasn't, wasn't going to make it, but about 30 minutes later, he started to scratch. He started to, to scratch. So I was like, he's, he's responding to stimuli. He's, you know, he's, he's still in there. And so I think it was about, I don't know, one o'clock in the morning. Or so we, we'd done everything that could be done. So we, we left and got back there the next morning and he was up talking, you know, and just, he was, he was fine. I mean, and I think he stayed, I think he stayed uh, another two or three days in the hospital. Um, but you know, for the, for the cost of uh, a nice dinner for two in Los Angeles, uh, the kid got another 50, 60 years of life. And yeah. that happens all day long, every day. Um, and to it's, see it uh, firsthand is just it's really the psychological jarring. and emotional side of it as well. Like it really you can is. Show pictures, a... You can show the pictures of a bite. You can show necrosis. You can show a kid screaming in pain. But the the sheer psychological and emotional terror they must be going through. No one can yeah. put it into words. Like we oh, might, yeah. I might be bitten at work tomorrow. I mean, touch wood, it won't happen, but I might be bitten at work tomorrow. I know that I'm a minute walk from the hospital. The hospital has all the antivenom. Um, I've got some of the best snake bite clinicians in the world at LSTM, otherwise on hand. I mean, for me, the psychological terror isn't there because I'm, I'm wheeled into a lovely, clean hospital. Everything's going to go perfectly fine for me. I mean, obviously there could be complications, but in, in the grand scheme of things, I'm perfectly fine. I haven't got that innate fear that, you know what, that those two vials of antivenom, if they're using, there's no more. You never know what's going to happen. And yeah. for example, the parent of that poor kid must have, you can't imagine the, the sheer terror and psychological trauma that they've been through, let alone the kid. And it, it just kind of snowballs, I think is the best way to describe it. Yeah. And actually seeing the crisis, seeing the doctors not being able to administer antivenom because they haven't got it, or yeah. that it's just not accessible, or they couldn't afford treatments and they've had to leave the hospital in a state that they shouldn't. Yeah. All of these. Yeah. So the documentaries like Minutes to Die, like the, the Venom interviews and stuff, really does help highlight what we see as snake bite initiatives, which isn't filtered down to the general public. There's, there's about four or five pictures of snake bites that I see repeatedly, which are the same pictures. And to be honest, they're not the worst that I've seen. But a lot no. of people are like, oh my God, that's horrific. And then you're sat here like, well, it's bad, but have you seen that on a two-year-old child that's yeah. her whole arm's necrotic because of it? Or something like oh, that. you've it's, seen... It's, uh, there, you know, there are some horrible bites that you know are used, and especially in clinical case notes. And it is it is hard on. I'm I'm sure you'll agree. It's emotionally hard on you, and you're not even involved in it as such. It's oh not yeah, your life at risk. Yeah, so but it's just, it's there's something just horrible about um, you know being in a situation like that, and you know being the foreigner standing there with a the camera, and you're just watching over it. This. Yeah, and. We had um, the last trip in Guinea. We had uh, we actually had two fatalities in this one clinic. In I think we were there for about ten days, ten twelve days. We had two fatalities within about forty eight hours. Uh, one from a gaboon viper and one from a mamba. Um, and watching someone die from a mamba bite is, you know, I can. Uh, it, it, it's a horrible thing to do, and mm. you know, we see pictures of bites where the bite itself looks horrible. A mamba bite doesn't look. I mean. I've had scratches from, you know, from orange trees that are worse than what a mamba bite looks like. Definitely. Um, but it is a horror, just a, it just, I can't think of a worse, more horrible way uh, to die than being fully conscious while you're, you're paralyzed. And yeah. we had this, this young woman who was bitten and it took her a little over two hours to get to the clinic. And she was in rough shape by the time she got there. She was um, in uh you know, a U.S. hospital or European hospital, she probably would have been saved. But uh, they gave her two vials of antivenom immediately. Um, and then they were preparing to give two more. And they realized it's too far gone. We're not going to be able to, to save her. And then, you know, to just, uh, to just stand there and, and let it take, you know, watch it take its course. You're is, waiting for them to die. That's yeah. the thing. Everyone's and just to, stood around. They know the reality. 
no and one then can do anything. Be, no, and then, you know you can't do anything. And then, um, you know, not that not that my experience in the the process is by any means the worst of it, but to sit and and then deal with that video over and over again, frame by frame, for years, as the the project progresses and it never gets, you know, it never becomes normal. And it, it shouldn't it become normal. No. Normal either. It shouldn't. Like it's. It is. It's absolutely in, incredible to listen to, and and it's, it's emotional. I can feel myself going. I can feel myself sat here thinking to thinking, holy crap! I did. I, did, I didn't realize that this, this is what it's like. This is, this this is people's this is, lives. Yeah. This is people's losing their lives, and of something that could be changed, and it it, it could be changed. And we yeah, need and to these do are what we can these are bites that it. are. Well, they're, and the, these are bites that are routinely solved. Um, you know, like, like, like Ed, you mentioned, if, if you were bitten by a mamba today, you would mm-hmm. probably, you, you might take a day off tomorrow, but you'd be work, back to work the next day because those Life bites. Likelihood is, yeah. Yeah, they're treated quickly. They resolve quickly. Um, mm-hmm. You know, something like a big gaboon viper or a that's that's going to take a little while longer. But um, a yeah, lot of these bites, they're, um, they're, they're perfectly treatable. Yeah. yeah. Aside from complications, there is no reason that it should be in that situation. Like I said, it's not an atro- emotional trauma for me because I've got the best care I can ever have. I know yeah. it'll be a bit, it will be a scary experience. Yeah, your biggest work is that, yeah, you, I mean, your biggest fear is going to be, oh, you know, the stuff I had to do on Tuesday is not going to get done now. Or, yeah. Um, and that oh, is, you uh, know, the tour is going to have to be cancelled. That's what a first world problem. That's a very first world problem. Now this this is it just puts into perspective what what this issue is and kind of and kind of uh, the issues is and I think unfortunately I, th- I think we're coming up to two hours worth of recording <laughs> so I think I think we're probably for one podcast probably at a little bit of a limit but I, I think we could probably do several more like hundreds and hundreds of these podcasts and. And Easily. there'd be always different stories on this, and there's always different takes on it, and there's, and, and I don't think we could do enough. Uh, I think, I think we could continue doing it. Um, I, I, so because of the time, unfortunately, Ray, I'm going to have to cut 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 it short at that point. That's okay. I, I but, understand it's getting late over there for you. Yeah, you know, it's not that late. It's eight, 8 p.m. So 8 p.m. is not too bad. I, I still haven't eaten yet today, so I need need wow. food, but. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for coming on, and we would genuinely, and I'm not talking just for myself, I'm talking for Ed as well here, we would we would love it if you would would come on to another episode in in, in six months' time again and, and discuss and, and discuss some more stories and some more bits and pieces that you've been working on and, and stuff again. I think, I genuinely think that this has been one of the most interesting conversations and just sit back and listen to i think i've ever had it's been oh, well, incredible thank, thank you so much it's been a it's been a pleasure i'm so glad we got to do this no it's the same same and, and, and i know we are just starting out as a podcast but we are trying to make sure that we we push home that this this is happening and and, and what what we can do as people to help it and what we can or just just to admit that it's happening and and give people the chance to talk about it and and that and hopefully we can we can get more people who are involved in 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 talking to us um, as well, and and just just thank you, genuinely, just from the bottom of my heart, thank you for coming oh, on. Thank, thank you, you so much, and I hope we get to uh, I hope we get to meet up over there at some point, or maybe maybe we'll cross paths in Slovakia at the conference there, and I'm if sure not, we'll uh, cross paths uh, in the future. Uh, yeah, um, I'm if, sure of it. Uh, I, I will. I would be trying my utmost hardest to. Uh, to definitely meet face to face, I think it would be it'd be great to be able to sit down, have a have a chat, have some food, and and actually get get into depth in, in about some of these stories that uh, sure about some of these stories that that you've got and that other people have got as well. So um so yeah, so I'd like again, I'd just like to say thank you once more, and I think Ed agrees, and and to, and from from our listeners as well, thank you very much. If if any of our listeners yeah. would like to know more about it, Ray, I, I think you'll you'll be the first person to say you're very very accessible. You're a very nice person to chat to. Obviously, I think this has definitely proven that. 
and um, we'll also add some links into the description of this if there's any more information you want on any of the initiatives the Ray's involved in um, or any of the work on Venom interviews that Ray's done and, and to the, the DVD and Blu-ray is still available um, please do buy it if you haven't seen it please do purchase it and, and got it I've got my, my copy on the shelf which uh, I, I do go back and watch now and again and uh, and and hopefully our our, our listeners enjoy, enjoy that. So thank you very much for joining us today, everybody, and uh, and we'll we'll speak to you all again soon on the next episode.